and pieces. So um, I'll just say a word of welcome. Um, I see some familiar Harris Center faces, but um, this is a co-sponsored event with Harris Center, um, New Hampshire Audubon, and also Keene State College. So for anyone who might be new to the Harris Center, um, I'm Brett Thielen, as I said, I'm our science director and the Harris Center is a nonprofit organization based in the Monadnock region where we help people fall in love with the natural world through land protection, conservation research and environmental education. So any of you who are local, I always like to share that we've protected more than 24,000 acres of land from development and much of that's open for hiking, birding and other recreation. Um, we coordinate conservation research on our protected lands and throughout the region, including working with partners like New Hampshire Audubon on a variety of community science projects like the one we're gonna learn about tonight. And then at the heart of everything we do is education for all ages, from babies and backpacks to residents of retirement communities and all points in between. And we have an incredible calendar of um, about 150 events every year, everything from guided birding outings to Zoom lectures. So if you're new to us, I would encourage you to check, a, check us out at harriscenter.org. Um, you can sign up for any upcoming events there. And we've got some really great ones coming up this summer. Um, and I also will we'll give a shout out to Keene State College. The, the Keene contingent of this um, monitoring project in the before times, before Zoom, we would host our training at the Keene State College Science Center. They've also been really supportive over the years of the, the Nighthawks that have taken up residence on their campus. So um, we're, they're kind of a silent partner in tonight's um, presentation, but we're really glad to be working with them. I know there's at least one Keene State person out there. So, hi, Beth. Okay, Becky, do you wanna introduce yourself and um, say a word about New Hampshire Audubon for folks who might be new to you? Well, sure, I'd be happy to. Hi, everybody. I'm Becky Swamala. And I'm a biologist with New Hampshire Audubon, and I've been here longer than I want to say. Uh, and I've been studying Nighthawks since 2007 uh, with New Hampshire Audubon. And uh, we are an independent state Audubon society. We're not affiliated with National Audubon. And all of New Hampshire's um, Audubon's focus is within the state of New Hampshire, where our statewide nonprofit um, like the Harris Center, we've got conservation science, we've got education, we've got sanctuaries, and we're also involved in policy issues. Um, many opportunities to participate in any level, but right now I just want to give a quick shout out to the Pollinator Garden at both the Massabesic Audubon Center and the McLean Center here in Concord, because they're just coming into bloom. And um, Nighthawks are insect eaters. Um, I, don't know how many of the pollinators they eat, but the whole idea of um, helping pollinators, helping the insect populations um, will also help nighthawks. So uh, if you're in the gardening mood, come take a look at those, those gardens. Wonderful, thanks Becky. Um, all right, I'm gonna do a share screen now so that we can start talking about nighthawks. So tonight, just by um, introduction, we're gonna talk about nighthawk basic ecology, how to identify nighthawks when you see them, and then this monitoring effort that we're hoping you'll be a part of, um, what that's all about, how to participate. So, right. Looks good. So um, tonight we're gonna learn about Project Nighthawk, um, which is a project to monitor a state endangered bird species, the common nighthawk in New Hampshire. And I always like to um, start off by, by encouraging you to think about this project as a treasure hunt and like, or um, like, so like any treasure hunt, um, the thing that you're searching for is very rare and sometimes you don't find it, but hopefully there's still some joy in, in the looking. And in this case, that involves kind of going out um, on summer nights and looking and listening perhaps in um, a more intentional way to the world around you. So, um, and there might be some nights when you don't see night hawks, um, but hopefully they're still enjoyable nights. Um, and I also wanna say, um, as, she can probably tell Becky is a, an accomplished birder. And she really knows, um, she knows birding and birds really well. And I am not. Um, and so I, I but uh, I do enjoy birds. I love learning about birds. And if you are like me and are sometimes intimidated by birding, I wanna just affirm that this is a project for you because night hawks are easy to identify once, once, once you leave uh, tonight, you should you should have a really good handle on that. Um, they're fascinating to watch. Um, they, they're really acrobatic 
and um, graceful and really interesting birds. Um, and uh, one of the things I like about them is that they, uh, you don't have to wake up at the crack of dawn to see them. <laughs> you can go out uh, in the evening. And so you don't have to be a morning person to enjoy these birds. So um, if any of you are new to birds and birding, I just wanna say you're in the right place and these could be a really good start for you. Um, so we're gonna start with the, the common nighthawk and we're gonna kind of start by talking about what a terrible name this is for this bird. Um, because they are uh, not hawks, they are not nocturnal, strictly speaking, and unfortunately, they're also no longer common. Um, so most people, when they hear nighthawk, they instantly think of a bird of prey. Most of the hawks that you're familiar with probably have, um, are, are birds of prey. They have talons, they have um, sharp bills for, for ripping apart flesh. They, you know, they're, they're hunting for mice or snakes or amphibians or maybe even other birds. And as you can see from this picture, nighthawks um, do not have a sharp bill. And that is because they're, they're not birds of prey, they're aerial insectivores. So they're eating insects on the wing. And so the name is actually a verb for hawking, for, for, for catching insects out of the air. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a misnomer and, and can be misleading at first. Um, that they're actually um, in the nightjar family, more closely related to whippoorwills. Um, they're also, the name nighthawk would lead you to believe that they're active in the night and they are active in the evening, but they are not, um, not active all night long. They're not nocturnal. In fact, they're um, something that is called crepuscular, which means active at dawn and dusk twilight times, which makes a lot of sense for a bird that eats insects because that's when insects are most active themselves. Um, and so just a word about their foraging. I love this series of pictures because it shows the gape in a nighthawk's mouth, um, how, how, how wide they can open that mouth in order to catch insects out of base, right out, out of the air. And they are um, pretty much exclusively insectivores. They've been documented eating up to 50 different species, but they're really um, flying ants, mosquitoes, moths, beetles. And I love this picture because you can um, see that this bird is just about to catch that insect right out of, right out of the air. Um, a word about their migration, especially as it relates to our efforts to see them. Uh, these birds have one of the longest migration routes of any North American bird species. And they also um, need to follow the flying insects. So they tend to be one of the last migrant species to arrive each spring, not showing up until mid to late May. And they're also one of the earliest to leave each fall when um, the, their fall migration peaks the third week of August. So they need to follow the flying insects. And when those, in if those insects aren't here yet or, um, or they're starting to die back because of frosts, um, they need to go. And this shows um, their kind of winter, their winter range versus their summertime breeding range. So, and as I said, you know, the name common nighthawk was probably once an apt description, but it's sadly no longer true. Um, they are endangered in the state of New Hampshire. They're considered threatened or endangered in Connecticut, Delaware, Vermont, Rhode Island, parts of Canada. Um, they're on the decline throughout their range, even in places where they're not considered threatened or endangered yet. Um, so one, one really, I think, amazing thing about nighthawks, we're gonna talk a little bit about their nesting um, behavior. And in natural areas, they're ground nesters uh, on open or bare ground. And when the industrial revolution happened, something they adapted in a really amazing way. And um, they started moving into cities and saying, you know. Uh, not saying, birds didn't say anything, but they moved into cities and they, they looked at flat gravel roofs and, and um, thought that those were just as good a nesting site as any ground nesting site. And they, they became urban birds that nested on gravel roofs and um, fed on insects that were attracted to city lights. And so from the 1800s onward, they became a creature of cities in the Northeast. Um, but one of the evidence, one of the pieces of evidence of their decline is that 
Now in New Hampshire, Keene and Concord are the only New Hampshire cities that still have breeding season nighthawks in their downtown. And that's compared to 16 different cities in 1990. And at natural sites, um, breeding occurs mostly in the Ospie Pine Barrens and on a handful of rocky ridge lines and granite balds. So they're declining in their um, more natural breeding habitat as well. So any of you who've come to some of my other talks, you know, I always like to include a few slides, the so what slides, why does this matter? Um, and so one piece for, for Nighthawks, because of that long history with humans and in cities, um, they do have a connection to people. So here's a quote from Henry David Thoreau, who heard Nighthawks booming. We'll talk about what that is um, from Mount Monadnock in 1860. Um, he heard them at a distance. Maybe they were um, even booming from Keene, who knows? Um, and as residents of cities, they became the part, part of um, many people's lives. So when we started this project in 2007, I was looking for rooftop nests and I ended up talking to a lot of people in Keene um, looking for these birds. And folks would say, oh yeah, I know Nighthawks. And I'd say, oh, are you a birder? Are you interested in birds? And they say, no, but I know those birds because they're, they're loud, um, they're showy and they're here every night. And in fact, I even had one person say that he grew up in Keene. He knew it was time to go home when he was outside playing with his friends when he heard the Nighthawks start to call. That was his sign um, to head home for the night. And of course, ecologically, they're also really important, um, largely for the, this role they play in the food web. They eat an incredible amount of insects. And like many other aerial insectivores, uh, they're on the decline everywhere. So the next logical question, of course, is why? Why are they in decline? And there's a lot of theories. Um, there's some um, concerns about habitat loss, either in their overwintering grounds in um, South America or nesting sites here, especially in cities where um, we no longer have as many gravel roofs. And largely, those are being replaced by PVC, um, vinyl rubber, pesticide use affecting their prey. We've Probably, I'm sure some of you have read about the insect apocalypse and the, the real um, decline in insect populations, which may be affecting predators of those insects. Also potential changes in the timing of their prey. So um, if they arrive the way in the same time they always have, and we've had a really cold snap because of all of this climate instability and there aren't insects for them to feed on, that can create an issue. Um, same thing for the, the very finely attuned timing of their migration routes um, and heading uh, down south for the winter, needing to follow the flying insects. If that timing becomes uncoupled, it, it could present um, be presenting a challenge for them. Predation in cities, we subsidize, uh, whether we know it or not, a lot of predators like uh, raccoons and crows and feral cats, um, just by virtue of, of, of you know, animals who do really well around humans, eating, eating our trash and what we leave outside, and, and then they may also find their way to nighthawk eggs or chicks. And then any number of migration hazards that could be present. But the bottom line is we don't really know, and it's probably not just one thing. It's probably a combination of things. Okay, so this is my um, slide where I, I turn it over to Becky. All right, so what are we trying to do with Project Nighthawk? Well, the Project Nighthawk has evolved over the years and what we're focusing on right now is, go ahead, Brett, um, determining where our breeding Nighthawks are. So there's, um, there's not an effort on migration at the moment. What we're talking about here is breeding season and where they might be nesting. And how many of them are are there in New Hampshire? And then we would like to try and identify where the specific nests are, if they, if we can. And sometimes some nests might need some protection efforts. Um, Nighthawks can be quite tolerant of disturbance. Um, they've nested as close as a foot from a forklift track. Um, so just kind of letting businesses know that they have a, a nest um, and that they can, if they can avoid it, um, that might be something that, that we would try and, and do. 
And then the other thing we try and do is to document what the behavior is uh, of nighthawks, either around a nest or not around a nest, um, but it is potential courtship behavior. And then if we've got a nest, can we figure out if they're successful? Because um, obviously one of the potential reasons for decline is that they aren't producing young. And that would have a lot of an impact on their population over the longer term. Uh, the behavior we, um, have used and continue to use when um, we are consulting on nighthawk issues, such as nighthawk get issues with wind turbines, um, but also when nighthawks do nest on a roof, if we don't have access to the roof to confirm the nest, the behavior can sometimes help us confirm that. So these are all, all part of what we're trying to do um, with these goals, with the, with the project, those are the goals. So to do that, volunteers are really critical. They're, I, I could not do all the watching myself. Brett couldn't do all the watching my, herself. We really need the help of volunteers out there checking different sites, helping us be in multiple places at one time. And this is one of the sites in the Ospi Pine Barrens. And um, it's a very buggy site. So we're kind of all um, trying to look up at the nighthawks, but also cringe away from the, the insects. Uh, Cause when you're, you're out there, when the, the nighthawks are active in that crepuscular time, well, you know what the mosquitoes do at dawn and dusk, they buzz around you like crazy. So actually, if you wanna watch in downtown Keene, it's a much less buggy place. <laughs> so go ahead. So first thing is you want to identify a nighthawk. And the big identification feature on nighthawk are those white patches on the wingtips. Um, they have pointy wings. They're around the size of a blue jay. And if you get a really great view of them with some light, you can tell the males from the females. But the males have that bright white throat. I've watched nighthawks quite a bit. And as you start watching them, I have yet to see really those bars in the tail very well. Uh, they look great in a photograph, but when they're flying around and the light's getting lower and they're turning and they're flipping, the, the thing that I concentrate on is the throat. The other great way to help identify nighthawks is the sound. And so Brett has a clip that she can play. So um, nighthawks make two noises, a painting noise, and then what's called a boom, which is a big whoosh of air. Uh, and I'll show you how they do that in a minute. Um, but you'll hear both of those on this clip that Brett's gonna, going to play. You'll hear the, the boom first, and then you'll hear the painting. And so they do, normally you'll hear peen, 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 um, and that's that's a sign you've got a very active nighthawk. Second. Okay. Well, when you're out watching, when you first start the the time period when you first start watching, it's still light in the sky, and you can actually see the birds. So if if they're around, you'll see they're flying overhead. You can catch those white wing patches. But if it gets darker, which it does, you haven't had any nighthawks. It's getting darker. And then it gets too dark to see the birds. That's when hearing them is really critical because that will tell you they're out there and they're circling around and they're doing things, but you can't see them. And when you get to that point, it's really helpful to know that females do not do the booms. They don't make that whooshing noise. Only um, the males do. And females do not peep very much. If it, well, supposedly they do, but I think I've only heard the female paint a handful of times. So you hear that painting noise. It's a, if it's a very regular painting, it's a male. So let's see how that works. That was a boom. They're the peens. 
The calling and booming are typically heard at dawn and early evening. The nasal paint is a call that is given in flight, and then you hear what sounds like a truck roaring by that suddenly just disappears, and that's a mechanical sound produced as the bird goes into a dive air rushes through the primary feathers and as it comes out of the dive the rushing of air ceases and the boom suddenly stops. The common nighthawk is a, a really graceful aerodynamic Great. So hopefully you could hear that that the painting noise clearly, and then that thing that they call a boom, which doesn't really sound like a boom, but is that that really strong whooshing noise. Uh, and um, that's something to, whenever you're on a site, you want to be listening for. All right, sound alikes, woodcocks sound just like nighthawks. Paint, paint. Paint. So the overlap time tends to be in May, end of May to very early June. That, um, woodcocks stop calling in, around in early June uh, and nighthawks will continue. And then nighthawks aren't here until late May. So if you hear some painting in March, April, it's woodcock. I have been doing nighthawk surveys where there have been both woodcock and nighthawk painting at the same time. So listen for where the sound comes from. If it's coming from high over your head, it's not a woodcock. If it's coming from the ground, it's going to be a woodcock. And if you're if it's coming particularly from a field, an open field, low down, wet meadow, edge of a forest. Um, that's also a high woodcock candidate. Whereas nighthawks are primarily painting when they're circling overhead. Sometimes they paint when sitting in a tree, but not really often. So lookalikes. The chimney swift is a bird which flies around also in um, urban areas. And it, you'll see them over keen, over conquered. They make this little twittering noise, but they're much smaller than nighthawks. And in general, they're not going to be concentrated like circling over a particular area the way the nighthawks do. The, the chimney swifts tend to fly all, all over the place and twitter, whereas a nighthawk, so watch for size difference and little shape difference. The other thing to watch out for um, sometimes is um, killdeer, which have pointy wings and sometimes nest on rooftops. So that's just another bird to be aware of. So while we're out watching, what we're, we're hoping for are signs of courtship, signs that we have a potential active nest site. That's going to be that painting I've been talking about where they're circling overhead. This isn't the straight straight flight line that they might be making when they're beelining to, to feed. This is circle overhead, paint, 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 and then boom. And that, that boom comes at the bottom of the dive. And if it's a potential nest site, the male would do this repeatedly over the site. It's a sign of a potential nest site. And um, in this next slide, you'll see there's a little diagram of the, the dive and the boom. So you'll see on the left side starts, the bird starts up quite high and then all of a sudden it dives down really low and low to the ground, all of a sudden it pulls its wings forward, comes out of the dive and pops back up again. And that's again, when you get that whooshing noise. And the lower part of that dive is oftentimes over the nesting area. So, so when you're out watching, you're, first you're trying to identify the bird, you're listening for it. And then as it, if you've got one that's peeking and booming, you're trying to figure out roughly the proximate area, where's that booming over? Because uh, that can be really helpful in trying to locate a nest. Go ahead. I, I just want to add that um, on occasion, I've been out with folks who had trouble hearing the boom 
um, if it's right over you, it's hard to miss, but it's a low sound. It doesn't carry as far. And you might see the bird diving um, and not hear the boom if you're a little bit further away from it. But if they're doing that pattern of that really deep dive low over a building or low over the ground, then there's probably a boom happening that you just might not be hearing. And it's still very much of interest. Yeah, good point. So nest here is in quotes. Um, we nest, but hawks don't actually build a nest. Go ahead, Brett. Um, they lay their eggs right on the ground, nothing around them, and they rely on camouflage for protection. So you can see here, their eggs look very much like rocks. <laughs> So you can see the circles are around the eggs. And what we've found is that nesting, successful nesting is rare. There are a lot of factors that can make it difficult for nighthawks to succeed. So in some areas, we have one female for every three to four males. But we've also had nests flooded out. That's what these left-hand pictures are. To, too warm weather, if it's too cold, there may not be enough food for them. And then there also are predators. Uh, and as ground nesters, they can um, have predation and we definitely had predation at nest sites. On rooftops, we think that crows may be um, predators at those kind of sites, but it also could be mammals that are able to get up onto the roof. So when a, a bird is in a natural area, the female, when she's incubating, will have this, this sort of natural camouflage and the chicks have a nat natural camouflage. Oh, and this is mentioning, Brett, maybe you wanna just say something about the um, keen nesting. Yeah, just to give a sense, people are always kind of shocked when I tell them that we've been monitoring nighthawks in Keen actively every summer since 2007. And in that time, we've only documented five confirmed successful nesting attempts um, in Keene. And, and Keene is one of um, the, the very few places, and in some years, maybe the only place in the Monadnock region uh, where nighthawks are nesting. So just to give you a sense for how special it is that we still have them in Keene and also um, how, how challenging it is for them. Um, so one, the good news is that two of these five successful nesting attempts happened in each of the last two summers. So we're, we're in a good, hopefully in a good trend, but. We got our fingers crossed. Yes. So go ahead. We'll have a couple of pictures coming up of females on natural nesting sites here. So you can see how their camouflage works for them. So oftentimes we are identifying nests based on, um, on be the behavior of, of the bird. This is one nest that we had in Concord with two chicks and it was highly visible. And we were able to um, get photos of the chicks as they developed. It was one of our first years with Project Nighthawk and I did not know how lucky I was. Um, to be able to get this. We have not been able to get the same kind of documentation since. Uh, so we've had successful nests, but this was a really unique opportunity. I just love this, um, this quote I threw in there that the eggs so closely resemble the rock, earth, or gravel on which they rest, and the young so simulate in appearance clods or horse droppings covered with mold that they seem to escape the eyes of their enemies. That's from 1927. And this is a nest in the Ossipee Pine Barrens, which is one of the few remaining sites where we have them nesting in natural habitats in the state. And you can see how well she blends in there. And this is a rooftop nest that you may not even see from this picture um, because this is a pea stone gravel roof. And um, in this picture is a nighthawk um, female and her chick, if you can believe it. Uh, and I'll zoom in to show you really just how well camouflaged they, they are. Um, just really quite remarkable. And I wanna emphasize again, it's often extremely difficult for us to access roofs or even sometimes ground nesting sites. And so um, we do try to do that when possible to confirm the presence of, um, 
a nesting female or chicks, but the observations from the ground are so critical for us to be able to, to ascertain what's going on um, up there on those roofs and in, in ground nests as well. So um, in terms of the surveys that we, um, that we undertake each summer and that we're hoping you'll join us for, there's kind of two groups of, two kinds of surveys. One is a coordinated or group survey, which um, we do a few times a summer. And the goal there um, is that we are all fan, we're all coming together to survey on the same night um, in the same town. So we'll have a few of these in Keene and that um, I'll coordinate and Becky will coordinate a few um, in Concord. Uh, and the goal here is that we all kind of fan out at the same time, same place. And so that if I see Nighthawk activity at Central Square in Keene at the exact same time that Beth sees Nighthawk activity at Keene State, then we know we have at least two different birds. It's a way for us to assess um, how many um, birds we might have in, in, a, in a town or city in, in a given summer, and also to try to figure out how many nesting attempts are going on. Um, those group surveys are informed um, immensely by individual observations. So people going out on their own to watch, look and listen for nighthawks. And then also individual observations are, are very um, crucial for when we have found a nesting site or think we have. Um, can help us keep tabs on that nest and get a sense for um, whether it's successful or not. Because the birds, as, as we said, will do um, some of the same behavior night after night, but then if they stop doing that, it, might, it means that something has happened, something has changed. Maybe the nest has failed. Um, and so the birds have gotten quiet at that site. Or maybe we can confirm that um, they are in fact um, seem to be feeding chicks now because their visits to the roof are, are, are happening you know, more frequently. So individual observations at known nest sites um, are incredibly value, valuable and individual observations at sites where we don't know yet are also really helpful for shaping where we monitor um, with our groups and just to get a sense for um, where Nighthawk activity is concentrated in a, uh, in a given year. Is there anything you wanna to add to that, Becky? No, I just wanted to give a, an example. Um, we have nighthawks that have nested at the Steeplegate Mall in Concord, New Hampshire, huge mall with a stone roof that we can't get up on, um, that it's not possible to get onto the roof. So we are totally dependent on um, confirming nesting by on the ground observations. And it often takes multiple different volunteers watching on different nights before we can get a, a behavior that confirms the, um, the breeding. So what are we looking and listening for? Whether we're out there as part of a group night, coordinated watch, or whether we're out there on our own, um, looking on our own. We're looking for these very specific behaviors that we've already been talking about. So diving and booming. Um, you might see ch a really exciting when this happens, a chase. Um, so uh, a male nighthawk might be chasing off another night, a male nighthawk, or he might also um, be chasing a female, be chasing the female nighthawk. That's part of their kind of courtship behavior. Um, and then we're especially looking for uh, birds that might be landing or lifting off repeatedly from a given roof, because that might be a sign that they are um, nesting on that roof or that there's a chick on that roof. Um, and these are the things that we're really kind of hoping to see. Becky, do you want to add anything about these behaviors? No, I think that's great. Thanks. So again, you know, what are we looking and listening for? These are pictures um, from Keene State from a nest a few years back. So males may circle really low over the nest location and they might eventually land on that nest, especially if, if the chicks have hatched because the males will be bringing food back for, the, for those chicks. Um, I will say, Becky's already mentioned this, the males are showy and loud and they really, um, draw attention to themselves. The females are stealthy and quiet and it's much more difficult to confirm the presence of a female uh, than to confirm the presence of a male, even if she's there. Um, but what we're hoping to see is um, you might see her slip off the edge of the roof um, as she's um, heading out to feed for the evening or you might see her return to the roof. Um, she, she may be doing it while you're completely distracted by the males diving and booming and looping around in the sky. They always kind of remind me a bit of a roller coaster, the way they kind of roll 
um, in the sky. But uh, if there's a nest, if there's nesting, the female will will kind of be be be, be quietly leaving. But she may I may become less quiet if the male chases her, or maybe you never see her, but the male gets really agitated at very specific times, and that's because she's becoming active, and that's kind of um, prompting him to be be more active too. So they may also, they may often chase females when they leave or return to the nest site. And um, if, if you are close by, they may fly in very close proximity to you as well. We've had that happen in this case, this bird you can see in the top left, he, he, he boomed quite low over our heads a few times while we were watching him um, over the course of several evenings. So um, is there any more you wanna to add to that part, Becky? No, that's great. Okay. So tips for, for how to do these surveys, how and when to do them. Um, clear, calm evenings are best. So, um, and warmer weather too. So when it's very chilly out, the birds may be less active because there'll be less insects um, out for them to, to forage. Um, so, you, you know, really a warm, clear, calm night. When it's really windy, um, it could be difficult to see or hear the birds and they may be less active. We don't do surveys uh, in rain. Um, Timing is incredibly important here. The goal ideally is that you'd watch for a full survey period of eight till 9.30 or so. It can be difficult to see um, towards the end of that. And so um, if you're not hearing the birds anymore, um, sometimes I might leave at 9.15 or 9.20, but um, the goal is to be out there for that full time. And that is because the birds, um, there'll be periods of activity within that window that can tell us a lot about the nesting status of these birds. And so if you're only out there um, for 10 minutes, well, so there's, there's periods of time within there that can tell us about nesting status and also just the presence of the birds. If you're only out for 10 or 15 minutes, it's possible that you just weren't there long enough to see the birds that were there. Um, and it's not as helpful for us. Sometimes we'll get emails from someone who just heard a passing peat. You know, they might have been driving by a spot and they heard a single peat while they were passing by. That um, those kinds of observations are helpful for knowing that nighthawks are present at all, but aren't as helpful for determining um, nesting status because um, a bird might be foraging fairly widely across the city and might be painting wherever it goes, but um, doesn't help us narrow in on a site like it does when you stay put for the full hour to hour and a half and, and really watch. Um, you can watch in the early morning. I've had a few volunteers do this. I am not that person, but you could. So we typically watch from half, let's see if I get this right, half an hour before sunset to an hour after. Did I get that right, Becky, or is it reverse? Yes. Um, so That's the reverse right. of that in the dawn would be an hour before sunrise to half an hour after sunrise. So it's very early in the morning if you want to do that. But they'll, the birds will be there if they're there at all. So again, you want to strive to watch for this full time. Um, something to think about as you're observing a potential nesting site is that females will typically leave the nest between 8.20 and 8.40 and then return between 9 and 9.15. This will change a little bit you know, with sunset time. But that's why we want to watch for the full window, because those might be periods of particular activity when um, the male is chasing the female or doing a lot of diving, um, a lot of booming, or you might see the female slip on or off a roof. Um, and so watching for the full time is your best chance for really seeing these behaviors that are indicative of nesting. So the question is, do you need binoculars? And um, <laughs> Becky and I have different different. Um, responses to this question. Um, I will say that I have a very difficult time using binoculars in low light um, with fast moving birds. And so I, I, I bring them, but I rarely use them. And that has probably a lot to do with my skill level at using binoculars. I don't find them that helpful in these low light periods, but Becky does. So um, would you like to talk about that, <laughs> Becky? <laughs> the time when, when it they're most useful is when you first start your watch, there's still sun up, there's still light, and it's when you can spot that white throat on the male. I don't know if you've been watching, but most of the photos, in fact, maybe nearly all of the photos, show that big bright white throat of the male. And that's something you can see, but you usually can't see it without your binoculars. So if you have your binoculars, 
when you first start your watch and a bird comes in and you can watch it circling overhead, that can be really helpful. Also, if birds take off into the distance, let's say you have two birds on a chase. Actually, this has happened to me with three birds. I had three birds on a chase and I thought, oh, great, it's two males chasing a female. And I followed it with my binoculars and I needed my binoculars to continue watch them only to see all three of them dive. That means it was a three male chase. So that was a confirmation. You know, I might've gone with an incorrect assumption if I hadn't been able to continue watching them with my binoculars. Um, so I say, yes, they're critical. But once it gets to, you know, quarter or nine and it's getting dark, unless you have a site where you've got some light that, that I mean, street lights or, or these sometimes work lights um, will be shining down um, th that allows you to actually see the birds that can be helpful. And if you are on a nest, if you happen to be on a nest site where you can actually see the nest, they also are pretty critical because even with your binoculars, sometimes you can see a feeding going on in low light. So it really depends on the, the situation. So um, another tip for doing these, especially for these individual uh, observations you might be doing is for your own safety. Um, it's great to bring someone with you. Um, it's also more fun that way, especially if you're at a site where there is not a lot of Nighthawk activity. Um, you can kind of keep each other company while you look and listen. Um, yeah. We in always, some place, oh. I was just going to say in some place like Concord, we have a number of sites where you're in a parking lot. The Steeplegate Mall is a, a good example of that. And I encourage people if they're, if they're not with a friend and they're concerned, just stay near your car so that you can get in and leave if you need to. Yeah, and, you know, this is low light times, it's later in the evening. And so, you know, you definitely wanna be aware of your surroundings. Also always a warning about private property, um, being careful. A lot of the watching we do is from public spaces like parking lots and sidewalks or in Keene um, on a college campus. But um, you also wanna be really careful that you're not walking into somebody's yard um, or, you know, especially if you see a bird being active, it can, can get very, it can be exciting and you, you kinda wanna follow that bird, but you have to just be, again, aware of your surroundings and, um, and watch from public places unless it's your own home or you have permission to be there. Just more safety, um, again, staying aware of your surroundings um, and leaving, as Becky said, if you, you know, if you staying close to your car, if you're out there alone, or even if you're not, um, and leaving if you feel uncomfortable, it's totally okay to do that. You want to put your own safety first. Um, I also uh, would recommend being mindful, and part of being staying aware of your surroundings is also being mindful of how people might perceive you. So we have had times in the past when someone was outside an apartment building staring up at that apartment building with binoculars um, and that made people in the apartment building uncomfortable because they didn't know what was going on. And, um, and so that's totally understandable on their part. Um, we had to have one night a discussion with local police about what we were doing out there. So just be mindful of where you are. You know, this is less of an issue on a college campus or at the, at the mall. Um, but if you are in residential areas, um, be mindful of um, your own safety and also how other folks um, might be perceiving your presence. Okay, so now we talk a little bit about the data and the data form, and this is Becky's um, cue. <laughs> yeah, this is part of my bailiwick. Um, we do have standard forms to fill out. So when you go out, and you get to your site, you want to record some of the basic information. You know, what's the date? Where are you? Uh, who are you? What time do you, did you start? Um, and some general weather doesn't have to be really specific. It could just be warm, sun, um, warm, clear, and calm, or, you know, just some of the basics. Um, it, it's helpful, especially um, for us to help interpret if there are fewer birds around. If you're out there on a cold night with your hat and mittens, which I did on one coordinated watch and we didn't have very many birds, well, had a lot to do with the weather. So that's just, just approximate as you can. 
And then there's a second box um, that's kind of a summary box. Um, in that, that red box that's on the screen there, the first part is, is a bird present on arrival? Please be sure and, and check that out. And if you know whether it's a male or a female, please, please fill that in. If it's unknown, that's fine. Um, and then the other part of it, the nest status and the total adult birds, you're not gonna fill that out until the end of your watch. So, and you'll fill out the end time at the end as well. We do keep track of um, the volunteer time that gets put in. So it's really helpful to get your travel time and how, how far you traveled um, as a volunteer contribution. So you've gotten there, you filled out your basic information and then you want to record what's going on or what's not going on. So the form has a lot of lines on it. And the first thing you're gonna do is record the time that you got there and whether there's no activity or there is activity. So you'll notice there are a bunch of abbreviations here. And those abbreviations, you do not have to use them, but they're there for convenience because I got tired of writing out peat every time a bird arrived and was painting. So we just created some useful abbreviations to make it easier to fill out the form. And so you get there, you got in this case at 745, all quiet, nothing going on, no Nighthawk. So just put that down. So then you're watching, you're listening, and then a Nighthawk arrives. You're gonna write down the time that the Nighthawk arrives and what it's doing. So in this case, it was painting, it was circling overhead and it was booming. There's a note that it arrived from the east. Now, what's the NM all about? Well, there, if you can tell it's a male, you wanna put that down. If you can tell it's a female, which is often very hard to figure out, you'd put that down. The N stands for nest male, nest female, but we use it even if there isn't a nest. It means it's the male on that site. So if you have a male come in, he's circling over, he's painting and booming, that's the male for that site. There won't be two males painting and booming at the same site. There will be a male at the site and he will chase off other birds that try and paint and boom at his site, um, but it's, it's his site. And then if he continues to paint and circle over, boom, you don't need to write anything more down until the behavior changes or something else happens. In this case, an unknown um, male, female, juvenile that weren't sure what arrived, it was silent and there was a chase that, that went on. And then they left the East at 7.56, everything was all quiet. So that's an interaction that happened, then nothing happened. So you're not gonna record anything until something else does happen. And so the idea is you record every time something new is going on. And if you, so this 803 entry, we've got a male that's painting, it's in the distance to the east. So we're gonna assume it's painting until 805, where it's observed circling. So the idea is that if it had stopped painting at 804, you would write down all quiet, painting stopped. So again, you just write down when there's a change in what you see. I always have to tell people this <laughs> and I get teased about it, no end. Negative data is still valuable. If you go out and watch at a site and you have nothing, let us know. Do a data form anyway. Even if all you put on it is watch from eight to 9.30, no Nighthawks. That's really valuable information because we have a declining population. And it's hard for me to make the case that it's declining if we don't have re the negative reports. All that says is nobody watched. So how do you know they weren't there? So, so anytime you go out, 
please do a report form. If you think you didn't see anything in, interesting, do a report form anyway. Uh, and we do like to, to get your, your forms in quickly if you can. Um, and if you can't get it in immediately, if you wanna just send a quick email that says, had birds, very exciting, or had nothing, that just helps us to plan for where, where do watches need to take place. Yeah, and, and in terms of how to actually get your forms to us, you can take photos of them, you can transcribe them, you can give us the highlights in an, in an email and then send a paper copy of your form in later. Um, but the longer you wait, the less likely you are to share that info with us is my experience over the years. So um, that very night or the next morning are ideal, um, even if it's just a, a quick few lines that says kind of what, what you observed out there. Yeah, but don't let that email substitute for the form. Yes. We have to fill out a form for you if you don't send a form in. So really appreciate getting that form. The forms, the, there's a version of the form that's a fillable PDF. So you can do it right on your computer if you wanna do that. Um, observers have taken various ways to, to gather the information. Some of them like me bring their, their data form and fill it out right in the field. Another one of my top volunteers just brings a little notebook, writes a few things, writes all the information down, but in shorthand, and then fills the form out on the computer. And that's great, makes it highly readable. Um, so it's really helpful to do that. Um, if you do take a picture of your form, it's great if you can mail it in later, because sometimes when I get those photos, I can't always read everything. Yeah. Um, so it, it's helpful to have that. I've also had um, volunteers who have recorded the information. They've got a little recorder with them. They'll say 804, Nighthawk, painting, booming, over the building. And then they go transcribe it later. And this but is also where having a friend can be helpful too, that one person's writing and the other person's got their eyes on the birds. And so, or, or is checking the clock, their watch or the clock so that you can kind of don't have to look up and back from your, whatever you're writing it on, um, you know, that you can work together so that, so that you're not quite as distracted as you might be if you're trying to take all your notes by yourself. So um, when you do go out, just there's a few reminders on what to bring or wear, you need a timepiece, whether that's your phone or a watch, because the, the exact timing of what's going on is really important to record. Your data forms, if you, if you want to record directly on them, I usually like to bring them with a clipboard, pencil for writing, uh, as it gets darker, it may be difficult to see your notebook or data form. So a headlamp can be helpful. Binoculars, as we said, and bug spray might be helpful. Uh, even in downtown Keene, the mosquitoes come out when the night hawks come out. Um, some of the when, so the coordinated surveys, the dates will be announced. So what we're gonna, what we're gonna do after this training is we're gonna send an email to everyone who registered with the recording, the link to the recording of this presentation, as well as the data forms, um, some other videos that might be of interest. And we'll also give you our email addresses, which I can put in the chat too. And if you want to volunteer in the Keene area, you can write me. And if you want to volunteer in Concord or other parts of the state, you can tell Becky and we'll add you to our email list. And then we'll send out emails um, when coordinated surveys, when we've got some in the works. Um, we do have to keep an eye on weather. So it's hard to plan those very far in advance. Um, but for individual observations, basically any night from now through July and maybe even early August in some places are nights, if it's clear, calm weather, to go out and watch. And um, in um, our emails, we will offer some suggestions for places um, to look based on past nesting activity. But some of that information in terms of like where in the state Concord, Keene, and Ossipee are our primary search areas, but there are other places. And Becky, I don't know if you want to say a few words about that. Um, yeah, I, my primary idea would be if, if you're in a particular area and you would like to watch in your local area, contact me and let me know if it's not Keene. Um, and then I can see if there are particular target spots. The other thing that you can do um, so uh, again. Let me know if there's a particular area that you would like to watch in, and and I'll just go from there, and we can converse about potential ways to locate uh, nesting sites. 
Great. And just for anyone who's in the Keene area, for you to know, um, we will, you can send in from, you can send um, one, your interest in volunteering to me, but also any data forms to me and everything that you send to me, I share with Becky too. So it's just a way for me to have a sense more locally what's going on to help me plan things like our own group surveys. Um, but it all goes to New Hampshire Audubon. They are the, the kind of keeper of the data and, and kind of lead on this project. So you don't have to worry about sending it to both of us. Um, I will get it to Becky. So just a quick recap as we're nearing the end here. This is a great picture I love from um, one of the resident males at Keene State a number of years back. So you wanna watch at a single site, ideally from eight to 9.30 or later if the Nighthawks um, are, are active after that and you can still hear them or see them um, until Nighthawk activity ceases. Clear, calm evenings from a safe location, recording both the presence and absence of Nighthawks. Again, it is so important to know that you were looking for them and didn't find them. Um, again, and you're looking, you're recording the behaviors and the exact time that they occurred both of those are, are, are vital pieces of information. And Becky, anything that you want to add to this? Oh, I don't think. Oh, a question. If you could rename the Nighthawk, what name might you choose? <laughs> oh, I'll have to think about that. I haven't. Wow. Uh, That's a, I've, no one has ever asked that question to me before. Um, That's a great one. Oh, I love that question. Ah. Uh, White banded painting. Uh, white banded hmm. painter. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> that does not convey sort of the coolness of the bird. The elegance and the yeah. um, acro acrobatic oh, white magnificence. Banded acrobat. Yeah, white banded acrobat. That would be a thought. Um, oh, they, they are really cool birds. OK, so our emails are in the chat there. Yep. Um, and that, let's see, I don't I think, are there any other questions that we didn't have a chance to answer? I know we're a few minutes over, or if anyone has any last questions that you would like to ask now. Um, and don't, don't hesitate to ask questions or to email if you're interested. Even if you're not sure whether you want to go out, we can always put you on the email list and you can decide when you get some further communication. Yep. And I'm hoping um, in the next few days to send an email out to everyone who registered that will have our addresses, it'll have a data form and, and then, um, so look for that. And um, oh, one last question, Jennifer's asking, any other birds worth noting like whippoorwill? Well, um, I note them, but I, I do that in an eBird entry. So um, I may have a, an entry for a site where I do note whippoorwills uh, because they they are around in the Concord area and oftentimes are at sites where nighthawks are active. So I like to know when they first start calling and I'll do an eBird entry with that. Um, and the one caveat I, I would um, suggest is that if you happen to be at a nest site that is accessible by foot. You don't have to worry about it when it's a like a rooftop nighthawk at Keene, in Keene, but we have had nests in, I mentioned these industrial yards and um, people will look at eBird and if they know that there's a nest, we'll have folks show up who wanna get photos of nighthawks. So I, I will delay putting my eBird reports in until the nest is through. Um, just so it doesn't attract um, people who will trespass um, to, to uh, see the Nighthawks or get photos of the Nighthawks. You know, the relationships with some of these building owners and property owners can be fragile. And we need to be really mindful of their private property rights and, and wanting to have positive and collaborative relationships with them. And so that's part of um, kind of maintaining that, the privacy of those sites. Um, and, you know, as, as, as Becky said in the chat, not everyone is excited to have an endangered species nesting on their property. And so, um, you know, we do our best to, to maintain good relationships with places where, where these birds might be present. And so part of that is, is kind of um, for the safety of the birds too, um, but as well as for the kind of ongoing, you know, safety of that nest site and relationship with who might, who might own that um, land or building is, is being discreet. Yes. So, yep. 
Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, we hope that a few of you, or maybe more, or maybe all of you will, will come out um, and look for these birds. I, I can't you know, emphasize enough how thrilling they can be to watch. It's really um, exciting to get out there and, and see the way they move through the sky. Um, very, very few things like it, and certainly not many things like that that can be viewed from a parking lot at the mall. So, um, or the, outside the library on a college campus. So it's a really, uh, exciting opportunity when they show up. And even when they don't, it's a nice way to enjoy a summer evening. So, And there's always something new to learn. I've been learning and think I know everything. And then the Nighthawks do something I've never seen before. You'll hear me, any of the keen folks will hear me say, well, let me ask Becky about that. <laughs> and there's lots of, lots of discussions about, you know, bird behaviors or timing or things that are different. And there's something new that is learned every year. And all of your observations are what help us better understand the behavior of these birds, which ultimately can help us better protect them. So 